All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us for today's webinar, Trail Planning Technology, a Digital Toolbox. My name is Candace Gallagher and I am the Director of Operations and Webinar Coordinator for American Trails. This is our 174th webinar in the American Trails Advancing Trails webinar series. This free webinar is being recorded. It offers, um, includes real-time closed captioning in English and also offers free learning credits. Links for the closed captioning and the learning credit quiz will be in the chat box if you don't already see them there. And attendees will receive a follow-up email with a link to the recording, the transcript, resources slide with the presenter emails, as well as learning credit details within two days following the webinar. And we are saving time for attendee questions at the end of the presentation but we welcome you to send your questions at any time um, during their presentation via the Q&A icon that you'll find at the bottom of your screen. And I'd like to thank the webinar partners today that include the Bureau of Land Management, the Federal Highway Administration, the U.S. Forest Service, as well as the Park, uh, National Park Service, and also our webinar presenters today. So I would like to introduce uh, we have John Atchold, who is the founder and principal of Chinook Landscape Architecture. And we also have Tony Boone, who is the chief operating officer with uh, Timberline Trailcraft, as well as principal with Tony Boone Trails. So I will now um, have John take control and start today's presentation. Great. Thank you, Candace. Uh, my screen should be popping up for everyone in just a moment if it hasn't yet. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, Trail Planning Technology, a Digital Toolbox. I'm going to let Tony start us off and I'll take back over in a minute here. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Tony and I still feel like I'm the luckiest boy in the world. I've been blessed to do projects on five continents, have been involved with some awesome master planning teams on over 40 master plans. I've worked with some really amazing crews on over a thousand miles of trail built and have also been pleasured to do about 2000 or so miles of trails designed, of course, with an accurate colonometer. And I'm also lucky to share my passion of sustainable trails with over 2500 students around the world. And after four decades, most importantly, I still love my job. I love working with John. We're really excited to share some of the tools that we've been using and that we've recently found as well. Perfect, and my name is John Altschuld. I'm actually a landscape architect by trade, uh, but I get into a lot of stuff that are kind of on the fringes of landscape architecture. So I'm very heavily into digital technologies. I'm an FA remote pilot, which is just a fancy word for a drone pilot. I'm also an author and presenter. Uh, I'll give one more shameless plug for, for the book I co-authored on drone technology at the end of the presentation. And I really specialize in outdoor recreation projects and restoration projects. Uh, I have a bunch of logos in the bottom right, just association. So Pix4D and SketchUp are both softwares that I have partnerships with. I help teach them, I help them advance their products. And both Tony and I are board members with Professional Trail Builders Association, PTBA. Uh, so, as I mentioned, my background's in landscape architecture, but very heavily on the ecological restoration and outdoor recreation side of things, which inevitably, uh, combined with visualization and technology, which is the other side of my career, led to integrating drones. Uh, so, only part of today's presentation is on drones, but we use drones as one tool along with all these other tools. And like a lot of the other tools, the drones started for one purpose. And we started, we were doing 3D modeling, but we want to be able to go to a site, fly a drone, collect project data, and then create 3D models from that. Uh, but like a lot of these other technologies, it led to a lot of other uses. So we use them for site analysis, for key feature inventory, for site planning, and all sorts of other things. And when we start to look at, at drones and we start to look at other technologies, we realize there's a lot of technologies that we use in our toolbox. So these are just a handful of them, and it ranges from Adobe products like Adobe Acrobat, Illustrator, Photoshop, InDesign, to the whole GIS suite of Esri GIS products, to QGIS, uh, to AutoCAD, to 3D modeling software like SketchUp, uh, even to phone apps like Onyx Hunt. And so we're going to go through a bunch of these tools with you today, uh, and, and one of the points that we really want to drive home is 
these are all just tools in your toolbox. So every project's gonna use them differently and you have to think about each project uniquely to try to figure out what tools fit for that project. When we talk about technology tools, we like to categorize them into three overall groups and they kind of follow the natural progression of a project. So that starts with data collection. How are we collecting data on a site, on a project? Next, design and mapping. So how do we advance that data into things that we can create designs, maps, graphics? And finally, we wind up with a bunch of different data sets and graphics. How do we actually present and share those with our clients and stakeholders? So we're gonna go through a handful of tools in each one of these categories. And I'll uh, let Tony lead us off, but we're gonna start with field instruments and then look at some of the online sources as well as GPS and phone apps. And we will hit drones and phone mapping a little bit as well. You're on mute, Tony. Thanks, John. I should have figured I'd do that. Yeah, my favorite tool is the clinometer, and I feel like it's an essential tool for laying trails gently on the land. Your sustainability ultimately depends on the grade of your trail, which is shot by the clino, especially in poor soils or extreme climates. And your user experience in the difficulty level is directly related to the grade that you're shooting on your clino. I want you to visualize a popular trail that you use. Think about a good section of trail, how it drains, how there's draining features, how there might be proper outsloping, how there's less rocks in the trail and the trail is more uh, firm and stable and less changing in, in, in weather conditions. Now, as you go around that corner, you come to a poor section of trail. Maybe it's an ankle deep rut, maybe it's a knee deep rut, there's loose rocks in the trail. What is the difference here, considering that your use is the same, your climate's the same, you've got similar seasons, you've got similar uh, soils, 99% of the time, it's about the grade of your trail. So the clinometer is essential to laying out trails gently on the land and providing a sustainable user-friendly trail. Digital angle gauges, tape measures, and digital levels are also useful when you're designing and especially constructing trails. Digital angle gauges and tape measures are often used when you're measuring technical trail features while digital levels are often used when you're measuring outslope on your trails. Also in our handheld units, we've got the handheld GPS, which is an awesome tool. Uh, those of you that are in the trail industry or any other kind of natural resource industry realize the value of the GPS. For us in trails, we can easily log our alignments and share them with clients. We can add positive and negative control points as well as construction notes that are geo-referenced on our alignments. And with the laser rangefinder, it functions a lot like the clinometer, but it also measures distance as well. So you can see from one ridge to the other and estimate your distance. It's a little bit less useful for me on design, just have a harder time looking through it, through the rangefinder viewer as compared to the standard inclinometer, but all very useful tools in the field to meet your client's goals. Thanks, Tony. And so then those are some of the more traditional tools, but they have advanced a lot over the years as well. And some of these are being either replaced or supplemented by phone apps. Uh, you know, our smartphones now have pretty accurate GPSs when compared to the handheld GPS units. Um, personally, for angle measurements like clinometers and the uh, uh, angles of technical trail features. Tony have, and I have found that those dedicated tools you just went over work better than the phone app still, but for tracking GPS and collecting some of the geographic data, some phone apps are super useful. Uh, so some of the ones we use a lot are Onyx Hunt, and then we do use a couple of ArcGIS or, or other GIS-based collection apps as well. And so we'll take a quick look at some of those. The first one is Onyx Hunt. Uh, this is in a range of a variety of, of apps that all do very similar things. Uh, Gaia, Avenza, their GPS tracking and logging apps. Uh, we like Onyx because we can pull in publicly available uh, parcel data very easily. Um, you know, it's only as accurate as the assessor's data where it's pulling from and as accurate as your phone's GPS, but it gives you a pretty darn good idea of if you're on your own property or if you're on someone else's. 
uh, lets us track and make markups, record photos. So we use this for a lot of our trail planning as well as trail existing trail assessment and inventory tools. Next up are a little bit more advanced tools. So ArcGIS Collector, Survey123 are both uh, Esri products, and then Fulcrum and Avenza are third-party apps. Uh, but ArcGIS Collector, Survey123, and Fulcrum all allow you to basically build forms. And so whether it's uh, public trail users or maybe it's just for your maintenance staff, you can set up preset forms so when they get to a spot, uh, like on the left, we have this drainage issue, somebody could pop open their app, they could log, hey, there's a maintenance issue from a drop-down list. They can attach a photo, it records the location, and then it can automatically get uploaded to your GIS account. Uh, the screenshot on the right is from a public project, a master planning project that Tony and I did together. And all those dots are input that we got from the public. So we basically said, you guys have a month or a month and a half, go out and we want you to give, you, give us info on how you use the trails and how you'd like to use them. Uh, so they had a drop down menu at each point they're at. Is it a trail you use? Is it an area you want to protect? Is it an access point, a maintenance issue, a favorite area, or an area that you want a new trail developed? And then based on which of those they, they selected, it would ask a pre-made set of three or four questions to give us more info. So it's a really unique way of getting a lot better public input as well. Once we get all that data, we're taking a lot of in, it into GIS or Geographic Information Systems software. Uh, so there's two big players in this. There's Esri, which is the company that makes ArcGIS. Uh, there's ArcGIS Pro, ArcGIS Online. They have a whole suite of products. Uh, the other side of it is QGIS. QGIS is also GIS software. It's completely free. It's also very, very capable software. Um, personally, for our work, we use both of them. It really depends on what we're doing. Some things uh, QGIS does better, some things ARC does better. Um, so there's really a variety of, of uh, options there. Also, Google Earth Pro. So Google Earth Pro is free. It's not as much for creating GIS data, but you can view a lot of GIS data in it. So this is can be very handy for uh, folks on your team that aren't as computer savvy or sharing with clients that maybe don't have GIS. Overall, our whole goal with all of this data uh, for GIS stuff is to understand a site enough to prepare the scope and fees for a planning project and kind of jumpstart the planning process before visiting the site. And we have some ways of doing that to get the data. The first one is Earth Explorer. Uh, Earth Explorer is a free website. I'm going to pop out of the presentation. We're going to actually go to Earth Explorer. There's a lot of different GIS data sets you can pull from it. One of the most common ones we pull right away is terrain data. Uh, so we can zoom really anywhere in the world. Uh, for this one, I'm going to zoom in on Fisher's Peak State Park, which is uh, Colorado's newest state park that Tony and I were working on the master plan for. Very easily, we can set a couple parameters. I'm just gonna say I wanna use the map for the area I'm searching. We click on data sets. We have a ton of data sets that we can search if there's any data for this area. Uh, I'm going to search for the SRTM, which is uh, from the Space Shuttle. Uh, I forget the exact acronym, but I believe it's uh, maybe Shuttle Reconnaissance Terrain Mission. Um, partially a guess, but it comes from the Space Shuttle missions. It's basically decent resolution imagery, uh, elevation imagery of the entire planet. And so we're going to select that and we'll click results and it'll pull up all of the results within this area. And then we can even we can click to see the footprint of each of these tiles, or we can even click the little button here and it gives us a preview. So this is a DEM, a digital elevation model. Uh, it's a raster image, it has elevations assigned to it. It's not real high resolution because it's all coming from space, uh, but we have this coverage for the whole world uh, and pretty good coverage overall. And we can download this for free, bring it into GIS, start letting us plan for our trips, our field trips very quickly and very easily. Other online data sources, uh, so local counties a lot of times have GIS data that you can either purchase or download for free. So local COGs or Council of Governments and county assessors is usually where you want to search. So a lot of times when I'm looking at a new project, I will be looking at the assessors, the county assessors website and seeing what kind of GIS data they have. Depending on the county or city, that might be just the property lines. It might be nothing, or they might have flown with a plane their entire county for imagery, elevation, and contour data every year or every two years. 
Uh, again, depending on the municipality, sometimes those are free, sometimes you need to pay for them, but it's a really good remote online source of GIS data. All righty, so I told you guys we would talk about drones. Uh, Tony and I gave a presentation on drones for American Trails. Uh, it's probably been a year or so, so we're not gonna go into a ton of detail with drones, but we are gonna go into the overview of how we use them on our trail projects. So the first question we usually get when we talk about drones is why do we use drones in our practice? And honestly, the answer is it depends. It varies for every project, but generally these are some of the common things that we, we run into uh, of reasons why we use drones. Uh, typically we're reducing the cost of site reconnaissance. We're expediting our schedule. We're minimizing our footprint on sensitive habitats. But while we're minimizing all those things, we're increasing the accuracy of our data increasing how much data we have and the types of data, giving us a better awareness of the context our site's within. And on multidisciplinary projects, we're working with engineers, environmentalists, uh, planners. These data sets are used by multiple parts of the team. Um, I do wanna note, this doesn't replace site reconnaissance. It makes our site reconnaissance a lot more targeted and a lot more efficient. Then the Second question we usually get is, okay, I get why you're doing it, but how do you actually do this in practice? And I generally group drone users into three overall groups. At the bottom, just collecting photos and video. And this is incredibly useful. It gives you a better awareness of your site, gives you a new perspective of it. It's also just great material for websites, marketing, outreach, things like that. There's a lot of people that do this. It's very low cost of entry, both in terms of actual cost and time for training. So it's very easy to get into and lots of folks use this. Next step up is collecting 3D data. And we'll look at this a little bit, uh, but I'm not gonna go into every step of the process like we've done on the past webinar. There's still quite a few people doing this. Typically they're using either photogrammetry or LIDAR. Um, a little bit higher cost to entry, especially for LIDAR uh, than just collecting photos and videos, but it's still not a, not a huge learning curve and not a huge expense. There's still a good number of people that do this. And then at the top of the pyramid, the third group is folks that are both collecting the 3D data and working with it. And there's not that many people that do this just because it requires an expertise and skill set from multiple fields of, of, of uh, study. Um, still, decent amount of people that do it, but a lot less than, than the other two categories. For Tony and I, we cover all three cat of these categories and it depends on the project. Some projects we're only collecting some photos and videos. Other projects we're going all the way to the top and we're collecting 3D models, we're manipulating the 3D models, we're working with the data, really is a case by case basis for what fits each project the best. All right, so we're gonna walk through each tier and just go over what these look like a bit. So first tier, photos and videos. Again, very low cost of entry, pretty easy to get into. The benefits are photos and videos are geotagged, meaning they have actual locations tied to those photos and videos. Can cover a lot of ground very quickly and you gain a better overall perspective of the site. Uh, so this is one, it's been a few years since Tony and I did this project, but when we were working on the master plan for 18 Road or North Fruita Desert, we covered 40 miles in two days. To cover that same amount of space, same amount of footage of trails and, and area on foot would have taken much longer. Did we still do a lot of foot reconnaissance on the property? Absolutely. But flying these 40 miles in two days allowed us to really target where we needed to get to on foot and areas that we didn't know we needed to, but now because of the, the additional perspective, they were highlighted for us. It also just provides site inventory information both in the field and in the office. So all these photos and all these videos come back to the office with you. Uh, so it lets you access them even when you're in the, in the office and no longer on the project site. I mentioned the photos and videos are all geotagged. So on the left is a uh, part of that 18 road and all of the yellow lines are flight lines. Uh, so the flight lines are geotagged. On the right is uh, each color is a different flight. And so in just a couple hours, we covered a bunch of different areas very quickly to get an overall perspective of the site and start to understand how things were organized and where we needed to go look on foot. Next step up, tier two, collecting 3D data. So less common, still quite a few people do it. I mentioned there's two main methods of doing this, photogrammetry and LIDAR. Photogrammetry is far more common because it's far less expensive. 
Uh, which one you use really depends on the project. Um, photogrammetry has a lot of really great uses. So does LIDAR. It's going to be a project by project basis, which one you use. And each of them do have their own nuances and kind of training that you need to, need to understand to get accurate information. So photogrammetry, I'm going to look at a little bit with you guys today. Uh, we get similar inputs or outputs out of both photogrammetry and LIDAR. Uh, photogrammetry in the Western US is what we use more than anything else. So photogrammetry is a technology that's actually been around for decades, not a new technology, but essentially it uses a series of overlapping photographs. And if you know some basic info of those photos, such as the point where the, each one was taken and some of the camera parameters, like the size of the sensor, the focal length, you can actually start to identify points in those overlapping photos and 3D coordinates with those points. Uh, so the end result is you get a very accurate 3D model of a site. The accuracy very heavily relies on the photograph overlap, the angle of the images, how far you are from the subject or the ground, and ground control points, which I'll hit in a minute uh, just briefly. This is all also data based on photos. So if your photos capture an area in front of a tree well, but don't capture the area behind the tree very well, that accuracy of the area behind the tree is going to be less accurate than in front of the tree where you have better coverage. So what kind of things can we get out of photogrammetry or LIDAR in most cases? First one is orthorectified high resolution imagery. Orthorectified is just a fancy word that basically we've corrected for the curvature of the earth and corrected for uh, distortions, physical distortions from the camera lens. So it's a flattened image and we can get very, very high resolution. Uh, this data set we're gonna look at a couple times in this presentation. If I remember right, we flew at about 400 feet above the ground and our resolution was about 0.5 or 0.6 inches. That means if we zoomed way in on this photo, every little pixel is 0.5 inches in real life. Uh, LIDAR you can get this with, but it has to be a LIDAR system also equipped with a camera and a, a good high resolution camera. We also get a DEM or digital elevation model. This is basically the same thing as the last slide we looked at, except instead of color, there are elevations assigned to all of this. So this one includes all the trees, includes all the buildings. This is just the raw DEM. Now with some GIS and photogrammetry work, we can pretty easily filter out a lot of the vegetation. Uh, I didn't worry about really filtering out the buildings on this one because we were focused on the canyon. But if I flip back and forth between these, you can see how we went from just the raw full surface data to just closer to a bare ground elevation data set. From that, we can always derive contours as well. These are one foot contours. Uh, it's being derived from the DEM, so you can set it at whatever contour interval you want. And then finally, we get full 3D data sets. So things like a DEM, uh, I would call kind of a, a 2D or 2.5D data set. This is a full 3D data set. So this is a point cloud. And this is not a photo, it's the actual point cloud. Uh, if you look at some areas, you can see some holes or you can start to see little pixels. If we zoomed way in on this image, we would see that there's hundreds of millions of points. And each one of those points is coming from that photogrammetry processing. Each one of those points has six numbers or values associated with it. An X, a Y, and a Z, so where it lies in space, and an RGB or color of red, green, blue. When you put all of it together, you get this really nice full 3D data set, and you can even convert that into a 3D mesh. So now this is a solid mesh that we can take into 3D modeling softwares or other software for visualization. The other thing that gets overlooked a lot is when we do this processing, we basically get a 3D site inventory. So for a lot of our clients, we'll deliver the full data set with the working files. And so then this is in the actual photogrammetry software, we could click on any one of these points in the point cloud and it brings up the original photos. And so we get really a digital twin or a virtual site inventory that anyone on our team can access at any time depending on their schedule. So what does the process look like? I mentioned I'm not gonna go through it step by step, but I did still wanna give you guys an overview. So this is our overall uh, part of it. The thing that I really want to point out is the drone flights are actually a pretty small part. You have to make sure to do appropriate planning in the office, light planning, weather checking, ground control points, which are crucial for, for accuracy. That's all happening before you go out. Then you go out, you fly the drone, and then you come back to the office. And then it's all about processing, ground control point data, 
getting to the deliverables you want, and then taking it to whatever you're doing. So it might be going into SketchUp, might be going into GIS. It really depends on what your project, where you're gonna take that data. So when you're out flying, lots of things to consider. FAA rules for the US, uh, there's similar rules in other countries. Distance, um, your flight time, how many batteries will it take, how many flights will it take, what flight pattern are you using, the changing wind and weather, and there's always unknown factors you have to account for. Ground control points, I've mentioned a couple times. These are really, really important. So ground control points are points that will show up in the photos that you know the, know the actual accurate coordinates of. Uh, when we talk about accuracy, there's really two kinds of accuracy, relative and absolute. Relative is measuring the distance between two points in a model. How does that compare if we measured the distance in real life between those points? Relative accuracy will be pretty darn good even without ground control points if you collect and process properly. Absolute accuracy is if we take the coordinates of a point in the model, how close is that to the real world coordinates in the certain projection system? That ground control points are absolutely critical if you want that to be accurate. All right, one last thing on drones. Uh, this is just kind of a fly through video. Uh, this is that same project I showed you where we filtered the trees out. This is the raw point cloud though. So as we're flying through, you can probably start to see some pixels, start to see the individual points. Um, this is a 3D data set and I'll let it play through. It's pretty short here, but you can see, I mentioned we use photogrammetry more than LIDAR in the Western US That's because even in decent tree cover like this with some good flights and processing, we can get really good ground data still. All righty, next slide. So, uh, phone mapping. This is new within the last couple of years. It's really started to take off. Uh, there's a few different apps that do it, but it's basically combining photogrammetry and then some of the newer iPhones and iPads actually have a small LiDAR sensor in them as well. Same process really as the, the drone photogrammetry and LiDAR I just went through, but you can do this with your phone. Uh, it has to be for much smaller areas. There are definitely some limitations but especially for technical trail features or focused areas, can be really useful to be able to collect a 3D model of something with just your phone. Okay, that was all data collection. Now we're into part two, second category, design and planning tools. So we've collected a bunch of data. How do we start to use it in the office now? First one is GIS. Uh, I mentioned there are two main players, QGIS, which is free, and ArcGIS made by Esri. They overlap a lot, but there are some things that each one does better than the other. GIS is one of the main softwares we use for trail planning. A lot of the drone data or data from public sources we pull into this, terrain data, imagery data, contours, uh, points of interest, existing trail lines, roads, buildings, parcels, can all come into GIS, and then we can start doing planning within it. It also plays pretty well with, with other software. So this is a screenshot where uh, the top screenshot is GIS and then the bottom is AutoCAD. So we were bringing a bunch of sections in, cross sections, cut through the landscape to understand slopes. And we brought those into AutoCAD to actually develop into some construction drawings for a project. You can also do a lot of the planning and design in GIS itself. Uh, so this is a trail planning project. The aerial image we're seeing is from the drone. So the Zoom up box is uh, talking about the, um, is showing the detail of the photo that we can get to. And then you can see we've actually started planning in our trail line work here. Um, I believe my AirPods might be getting low on battery, so I might have to just hold my phone to my, my uh, face in a second here. Um, but again, in GIS, we can actually do our trail planning. All right, Adobe products. So Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign, Premiere, we use these in a variety of ways. It's different for every project. These images, they were simple drone photos and we we're able to very quickly, very easily mark up the issues with existing conditions and our proposed designs and solutions. And it makes it a lot clearer, along with a little bit of text, what we're trying to propose here. Again, this is another example, simple drone photo, Photoshop and InDesign uh, can go a long ways to explaining a concept or explaining existing site conditions. And we can combine all sorts of tools. So this is a trail map we made recently. 
We use drone to collect the aerial imagery and the terrains and then GIS to develop the contours uh, as well as the trail line work. Then we used Photoshop to make some of the features. And then we used Illustrator for illustration features and InDesign to make the final layout. So again, these are all tools in your toolbox. Combine them and combine them and combine them differently on every project. 3D modeling. This one we don't use as often on trail projects, but sometimes it's very useful. And sometimes it's in combination with the drone data. Sometimes it's standalone. Uh, so this was a model modeled standalone, not with drone data at all. On the flip side, we can take our drone data. I mentioned we can get to a 3D mesh and we can take that into a bunch of different 3D modeling softwares. Uh, this is showing some drone data in SketchUp. And then we can very quickly be modeling in an accurate site context. Uh, so in this image, the bridge and the trail are proposed. They did not exist. And everything that's kind of the white grid is from the drone. And very quickly, we can get to some really great visuals as well. Uh, so these are all renderings I'm going to flip through, all from the same project. And pretty good looking renderings um, for this proposed bridge and trail. Now, the really nice thing about this is the efficiency. So that project, the entire thing, was about two days of work. The drone flights were about three hours. That includes about an hour of uh, flight time and an hour of travel each direction to the site. It took about an hour to process it. And when I say an hour to process, that's my time. Uh, so with the photogrammetry or LIDAR processing, you have some time that you're giving the computer inputs, and then there's a decent amount of time where the computer has to just work on its own. Uh, so about an hour of my time actually working on it then built the 3D model in about a little over a day, day and a half, and then spent a couple hours in Lumion, in which this is adding the lighting, the materials, making it look really, really fancy and good. Uh, but the entire thing, start to finish, a couple days of work. We can also start to combine our tools in different ways. Uh, so this is Fisher's Peak State Park. Um, this is the site we chose for, is the most likely for the visitor center. And so we wanted to design the visitor center and its surrounding amenities. Um, so this is drone data that we collected, brought into SketchUp. The problem is it doesn't really capture the context very well. You know, the visitor center is going to be aligned, so it has this great view on Fisher's Peak, uh, the namesake of the park. You know, there, there's a lot of surrounding terrain here that doesn't capture and that it's not at all feasible to map it all with drone. So instead, what we did is what I call photo match. So we use the drone data to do our design of the actual site area, but then we take some other photos of the property from the drone. So this is just a single drone photo. The visitor center is going to go right on this area. And then what we can do is we can align the drone photo with the 3D model. So here's the same exact aligned view with the 3D model. We overlay the two, and so now you can see they overlay, but there's a lot of stuff that doesn't work correctly. Uh, so right now we've used the drone technology and photogrammetry, and we've used SketchUp. Now we're going to combine it into Photoshop, and we're going to do a bit of Photoshop work, and then we can make the two images basically merge or work with each other. So things like where the trees should be in front of the proposed road versus behind, we're just using Photoshop to merge those together. You can also then take those and combine a number of them into GIFs. So this one isn't so much a trail project, although there were some trail aspects, but this is a series of like four or five photo matches, like I just showed you with the visitor center, showing the construction phasing of this project. And in Photoshop, really quickly, we can combine it and make an animated GIF. Okay, now we're to part three, presentation and sharing tools. Uh, so we have, Tons of graphics. We have GIS maps and line work. We have photos we've taken on site. We have point clouds, 3D meshes, 3D models, DEMs, uh, all sorts of stuff that we've done. But how do we share them with the clients? Of course, the easiest way is just a PDF. Uh, but we can use a software like Adobe InDesign to make the PDF a lot more interesting, a lot easier to read, a lot easier to understand. Also a lot easier for the clients to share and want to share. And, and a lot of times our projects, if we're in a planning phase, the client still needs to figure out how they're funding the project. And so they can use these documents. And when they're going after a grant funding source, for example, something that just looks better will go a lot further when they're getting graded against other projects that maybe are just in a Word document. 
We can also use Pix4D Cloud. So I'm actually going to hop out of the presentation and show you guys a couple examples. Uh, Pix4D Cloud, so Pix4D is a photogrammetry software. Their cloud platform is simply an online platform that you can share photogrammetry data on. So the photogrammetry data, super interesting to look at, um, but how do you share it? They're huge files. So this is the first project we'll look at. This is the video we saw the fly through of the, the kind of canyon area. And I'm just in uh, Google Chrome right now, but we can share this with clients. Doesn't require any sort of special software. We can zoom in. It's gonna load up a little bit slow, but we're looking at the point cloud right now. And if I get it, give it a minute here, you can see it's going to get refined and refined closer and closer. And then we can also switch from this to the 3D mesh, which usually takes a, a little bit to load up. Uh, these are kind of reduced quality versions of what we have in the desktop version, the full data set, but it's still a really good data set to start sharing with the client so they can start to understand what we're looking at. Uh, we can also go to a 2D view, which gives us a higher resolution version of the image. So if you remember, I mentioned that this one was, I think 0.5 or 0.6 inch resolution. We zoom way in on the parking lot, you can start to see the, the kind of resolution we can get even from you know, 350, 400 feet up in the air. So Pix4D Cloud is a great resource for sharing those drone data sets, uh, but we actually can do even more with Pix4D Cloud. So we can even start to mark stuff up. So this is a, a project we're working on looking at planning some trails in some very challenging areas. And these are uh, trails that the client has been able to go in and start marking out potentials because they've spent a lot of time in this area starting to work out grades and potential alignments with their client. -out. And so they can start to mark all of this out and we can download the data. We can work collaboratively with the client. Uh, you can even have it cut an elevation profile. Uh, I'm not going to have it do it because it's going to take probably five or 10 minutes. But if I do that, it will create a section line like a cut section elevation profile for this entire thing based on our data set. Uh, so super, super useful tool. These markups and lines show up in both the 3D and the 2D view. Uh, so if I go to our 2D view, all of those lines still show up. Uh, so it, it is geolocated with this data set. Again, super, super handy, doesn't require any software. So it's very easy for clients to share that. Next one is Sketchfab. Uh, I'm not going to load this one up. It's pretty simple. So we make a lot of 3D models for smaller 3D models. This can be a really easy way to share them. It just hosts the 3D model online. Uh, we do use this in conjunction with some other software that I'm going to show you in a minute here. So web maps and web apps. These are both Esri products. Again, Esri is the, the kind of the main name in GIS. They're the paid software. And one of the things that they do better than QGIS is they have a lot of online products. Uh, QGIS is really all desktop based. Uh, but Esri has these really great web products. Web maps and web apps are two we use a lot. I know they sound very, very similar. Uh, web map is basically what it sounds like. You can make an online accessible map. A web app has a web map placed inside of it. Uh, so there's more functionality. So this is an example I'll show you guys. Uh, it should load up for you here. So this is a web app with a web app placed inside of it. We can add any sort of pop-up if we want. There's all sorts of functionality you can add to these. If I zoom in on this one, we actually have our drone image in here. So you can start to see we have really good resolution. Uh, photo in here. We have our contours from the drone data. We also have our plan trails. Uh, and so that's all in the web map. Now, because we have the web app, we can also add some additional functionality like a trail links widget. So they can click on any of the trails. We'll show the pop up, but over here they can also hover over it and they can see the trail length. They can see the trail costs if we have those plugged in, points of interest types. Uh, we can do a swipe. So for this swipe, we have it that they can basically swipe between the aerial image and just the base map of the, the terrain. Um, all sorts of functionality you can work into these web apps and web maps and very, very good, useful tools for sharing the data. Next step up from that is story maps. 
This is another Esri product, and we find this one to be very, very useful on a lot of projects. Uh, a story map, again, it's an Esri product. The web map and web app are really limited to showing just GIS data. The best way to think about a story map is it's a very slick interface to make a website and web page that can host GIS maps, photos, videos, 3D models, sounds, uh, all sorts of data, and you can guide people through a narrative. So this one that I'm going to walk you guys through a bit is actually a collection of multiple story maps, but it's again accessible online. So people just need Google Chrome or some sort of internet browser to access it. And then we can guide people through. So this project, Tony and I were hired to do an assessment of some specific trail areas at Lake Pueblo State Park. Uh, I believe it's actually under construction right now. One of the really big benefits to this is it's so much nicer looking. It guides people through the decision process so much more than a simple PDF or a simple Word document. Um, so our client on this one, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, they got a final PDF that's good for the records, but they got this as well. And they were able to use this when they applied for their internal grant program for funding. And compared with other projects that maybe just had a really simple PDF or Word document or spreadsheet, this blows it out of the water. So they got funding approved for the entire thing on their first pass through. Um, and sure, a, a big part of that is it's a needed project. Um, it's a, a good project. It's not some crazy budget, but all of this backup of why the decisions were made and why it's needed is covered in here. So if we take a look at our story map, I'm not gonna walk you through the whole thing, but through some bits of it, we can kind of walk people through the overview and purpose can see these chunks are just uh, photos and text, but it's a nice, nice slick interface to kind of scroll through, can fade between them. And then here we're starting to get to our first interactive part. So even though this just looks like an image, it's actually a GIS web map. So we can pan around, we can zoom in and out, we can click on things if we programmed it that way. So for example, this one we had it programmed where you could click on the trail and it was linked to the improvements for that trail. Uh, we also have the difficulties, um, issues, and we also had the trails linked. If you click on a different one, it'll actually link you to the MTB project link for that trail. So you can include a lot of interactivity, a lot of info in these story maps. And I'm gonna skip ahead to some of the other sections of this. So first one I wanna show you guys is this one. Uh, so this is called, it's actually three trails, Creekside, Waterfall, and Log Drop, and we can explain what the issues are. And this one, we used, a, again, a GIS map here along with text on the left, and you can set parameters. So as I'm just scrolling down the page, it's automatically zooming into this area and highlighting the trail we're talking about. I zoom down a little further, it zooms in, it actually turns on our drone data for this section and highlights this waterfall trail that we're talking about. Keep scrolling down, zooms in either further, talk about this third trail called Log Drop. Then if I keep scrolling down, it zooms further out and starts to look at how these trails work together and fit into the overall hierarchy of the project, uh, of the site. And with that, we also pulled in some Strava data to look at, okay, this section of the trail is actually not that used, but it has big environmental impacts. And so then we can use that to explain our decision to make this section more permanent and either close or do seasonal closures on the section that is not used as much. We can also put 3D models into this. Uh, so for example, as I scroll down to this next section, we have this canyon, there's some environmental concerns. So we were asked to look at rerouting the trail higher up on the slope rather than being right down in the bottom. And we imported, this is a, actually it's a video of the 3D model in this case, but showing the drone data and two alternatives that we looked at for rerouting. Uh, however, there were some pretty major problems with each of these, and we determined that either one would have a lot more impact than simply leaving the trail as it is and implementing some seasonal or temporary closures. But we can walk through that decision so that whether it's the grant funding, um, the uh, grant grading committee who's selecting the, the grants that get funded, whether it's our client trying to understand it, have a really clear understanding of what we're trying to explain to them uh, and why we made the decisions that we did. 
So some more photos and, and text down here. And I'm gonna skip ahead to one of the other sections. Uh, let's go to this one. So this site has a lot of wood TTFs or technical trail features that were really built with uh, kind of substandard materials, not to best management practices. So we want to address that. So we walk through the issues. This is another video of a drone 3D data set. And so it just plays automatically, but we have our bullet points that people can read through while they're, they're seeing the visual of what we're talking about in the text. Scroll down a little bit more and we talk about our recommendations. So this we actually brought into SketchUp and we modeled or highlighted in red the pieces that we wanna remove, which is exactly what they're reading about on the right. But then at the same time, it's also talking about, we are going to replace it with wood TT, or sorry, with rock TTF. And these rocks or stones, there, there are several good sized slabs right there that can be moved into places. And so we're able to show all that in the model. Very visual, fairly interactive, very narrative in explaining our decision process. And then one last one that I wanna show you guys on here, we're going to take a look at this one called Steep Tech. Uh, this is a really interesting area. Um, somewhat, oh, I'm gonna switch off my AirPods. All righty. Sorry about that. So I'm going to keep scrolling down here. And this one is an actual 3D model. So it takes a little bit to load up here. Um, it'll take a minute, but this is using that Sketchfab site. So on Sketchfab, you can upload a model and then we can just embed it into the story map. This one, we have annotations of kind of the existing conditions and it's just auto playing through these or I click, can click the arrows and it's giving our assessment of each of these areas in the trail. Uh, so very telling, very interpretive, or very uh, interactive, very useful for these folks to be able to use. All right, back to our slideshow. So gonna wrap up here and let Tony give some comments then open up, we want plenty of time for questions, but really the biggest take home message we have for you guys is these are all tools. Don't think that you're gonna use one of them on every project. Don't think you're gonna use all of them on every project. Don't think that there are other tools out there that you'll never use. Approach each project individually and try to find creative, unique solutions with a combination of different tool sets. And even though these are mostly digital, they're all tools in a toolbox and that's how we really want you guys to think about them. Uh, I'll let Tony give some closing comments. Otherwise, uh, one shameless plug I promise you guys, I do have a book out, it's on Amazon. Drone Technology and Architecture, Engineering and Construction, and both Tony and my emails are there. Definitely feel free to reach out to us. And that's the number one bestseller, by the way, on Amazon. <laughs> in the uh, civil engineering category. <laughs> lots of publications in that. So yeah. while John is maybe looking through some of the questions here, I am going to answer a question from Hugh, Hugh Duffy, uh, who worked for National Park Service for decades, uh, one of my mentors. And his question was, <clears throat> please comment on professional judgment required to apply to the various tools to achieve sustainable trails. Uh, and ultimately, that kind of takes me back to my mentor, who was Jim Angel. And what he said was, people don't need trails, the land does. And what Jim meant by that or what I took Jim to mean by that was that proper and sustainable trail planning, design, construction, and routine maintenance program is our best way to protect our cultural and natural resources for future generations. I also believe that trails and proper trail planning and sustainable design and construction is one of our best ways to get our youth into the outdoors and involved in the outdoors so that they begin to protect our natural resources and Mother Earth, like many of us in here, our jobs do. Uh, so the key to sustainable trails, of course, is following the principles of sustainable trail constructions. And those are provided in a number of documents. Hugh Duffy has one called Mountain Trails Management, which is an awesome book I would recommend. Uh, the Emma books are also well. They talk about the half rule. They talk about maximum grades. Uh, they talk about rolling contour design and the half rule, all that. And those things are key because 
one of the concerns that I guess professional trail builders and planners have is, is if your plan is not based in tech, uh, in sustainability, and you do this high technology stuff, it all looks glitzy and fancy. But if it doesn't work on the ground, it's not going to work in some fancy plan either. So having the basics of sustainable trail planning, design, and construction is essentially one of the key components before you start going out and pulling in these fancy tools. Excellent. Thank you so much, Tony. Um, <clears throat> We got a lot of questions that came in, um, but we do still invite many of you, if you still have questions, to ask them here because I will work with the presenters following the webinar um, to answer any unanswered questions. But we do have a lot of time for Q&A today, so I'll go ahead and just dive on into additional questions unless Tony saw some other ones that he wanted to answer right away. Um, I think one of the ones that John can answer, there were several questions related to that. Uh, and that is the use of the photogrammetry and the drone in heavily forested areas, as well as some of the other apps and tools that we use. What are the, the benefits and uh, the constraints of those different types of terrain and topography and veg? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yep. Um, so I'll talk about veg a little bit. And then, Candace, I have the Q&A up if you want me to just start going through some of the open sure, questions. Sure. Go that. ahead. Yes, yeah. please. So for the uh, vegetation cover. So um, photogrammetry versus LIDAR, that's usually the biggest difference. It's also one of the kind of, I'd say biggest misnomers that, that folks sometimes have. Um, LIDAR sees, can, can penetrate is what it's called uh, around vegetation better than photogrammetry. However, there's a big misconception that LIDAR can see through vegetation. And that's not the case. Um, so photogrammetry, only what shows up in the photos is what you'll get data on. So in the Western US, we don't have very many really, really thick forests. Uh, so, you know, it, it's not that often that LIDAR can do a lot better than photogrammetry, just because if we change our flight patterns, we change how we collect the data a bit, we can usually get some good images of stuff below or around the trees. When you start getting more tropical or more in the Eastern US, you start getting a lot thicker vegetation. And that's where LIDAR will start to outshine photogrammetry more often. Uh, with either technology, even with LIDAR, you do get to a point where the, the vegetation is so dense and thick, the only way you're going to get much ground data is with a very, very, very powerful, very, very expensive LIDAR. I'm talking being flown in a plane, millions of dollars of investment, and flying over dozens of times. Uh, so, you know, like they've done some really great LIDAR stuff in Central America, uh, finding basically hidden landforms of ancient temples. Um, I know some of the folks who've done that work and it's amazing work, but it's been millions of dollars of equipment flying over the same area 25, 30 times to get a point on the ground every meter, every couple meters. Um, so that's kind of one of the misconceptions with LIDAR, but take home message is either one will struggle with vegetation if it gets to a certain thickness. Uh, LIDAR will beat out photogrammetry for vegetation for when you start getting thicker up until you get to that point where either one is gonna have difficulty. Um, all right, I'm just gonna start at the top. Uh, somebody commented that ArcGIS collectors being replaced by field maps. Uh, that's great, uh, I didn't know that. Um, sounds like it has the same capabilities and maybe even more. So I, I definitely need to check that out. So uh, thank you for that. Um, in what ways can ArcGIS be utilized to help with conducting trail maintenance? So I'd say the biggest ways are GIS is a geographically uh, tied database. So if you use Survey123 or ArcGIS Collector, which is being replaced by field maps, you can set up pre-made forms, uh, fulcrums and other options, the third party, but again, you can set up these pre-made forms and then your staff members or members of the public, if you want, can report and track maintenance issues. You tie that into your ArcGIS databases on the office side. And then you can have a full database of this section of this trail is condition eight. This section of this trail is condition two. This bridge needs replacement. Uh, so it starts to become, can really kind of become your hub of how you're, you're understanding and organizing your maintenance needs. 
Uh, is there a drone manufacturer you recommend for typical pictures and videos of sites? And does someone in your organization need to get a special license to use a drone? Uh, so as far as the manufacturer, there's a handful out there. DJI is the, the, biggest, the biggest one, the most well-known one. Uh, all of our drones are DJI. Um, they're very reliable. They work very well. They're, they're good quality. Um, government organizations in the U.S. will run into issues because they are a Chinese company, so they have limitations on if they can purchase them. However, most of the government agencies can still hire a consultant like me or Tony to uh, fly it, and we can use whichever drone we feel is the best fit. There are some U.S. made drone companies that are coming close to competing with DJI, but only on the very, very expensive drones, like the nine to ten thousand dollar plus drones. Um, there, there's a couple that are coming. I would say coming pretty close to being comparable. Uh, Skyfish, and um, I'm blanking on the name of of one of them, but there's a few U.S. ones as well. Uh, I'd say most folks for trails are typically not looking to spend ten thousand dollars plus on a drone, so the DJI drones in the thousand to two thousand dollar range are much more applicable special license depends on where you're at so for the us you do have to have a remote pilot certificate from the faa very easy to obtain uh, but you do have to have that for any commercial use of a drone in the us most countries have similar regulations but it's a country by country basis have you found use in Google Earth Engine API? Uh, I do not have access to Google Earth Engine. You have to be, I think it's a researcher or an academia to get access. So I'm sure there are great uses in there, but I um, just don't have any, any firsthand experience with them. Uh, next question, kind of repeating with some other stuff we've gone over, but can ArcGIS Collector or Field Maps uh, or Survey123 be used to collect trail maintenance issues for users, from users? Absolutely. Um, the only thing I caution folks on is you have to understand and think ahead about what you're getting into. If you're opening that survey one, two, three, or that field map up to the public, you need to make sure you have enough staff to handle that data coming in. Some places, maybe it's not that big of a deal. Some places like Boulder, uh, Colorado, you'll probably going to need a single staff person at least dedicated to just managing that data that's coming in checking if it's accurate, checking if you guys want to send a trail crew to address it, if it's, you can change different settings, but if it's something that other folks of the public can see what other people have submitted, you have to have kind of a check in there to make sure people aren't, you know, attaching lewd photographs, for example, as a trail maintenance issue. Uh, so there are actual staffing issues that you need to keep in mind when you open that up to the public. How large is the 3D point cloud file? Uh, they're big. They're, they get very, very big. Um, so with photogrammetry and LIDAR both, file management becomes key. Um, point cloud specifically, I'm gonna get a little nerdy here, but there's two main file types, LAS and LAZ. LAZ is a compressed version. It's basically like the zip file version of an LAS. The really neat thing is an LAZ is lossless so it means you're not losing any quality, any data, but it's a fraction of the size. Um, that being said, I have point clouds all the time that are in the six gigabyte plus range for each point cloud. So they get really, really big. Uh, RA discussed LIDAR. Uh, okay, next one. I just bought a DJI Mini 2, hoping to start dabbling into flight plans and photogrammetry with the drone link app, maybe create some DEMs, contour maps, don't have ground control points. Do you have any recommendations? Um, I'm not familiar with the drone link app. Uh, I use a couple different apps for flight planning. Uh, for the flight planning, when we're doing automated, I like Maps Made Easy Map Pilot, although I can't remember if that one's on Android or not. Pix4D, I like to use for the processing. Their flight planning app is so so. Uh, it's called Capture. Um, if you want to just really dabble into it a little bit, Maps Made Easy has an online processing as well, where basically you upload the photos, they do the processing for you, you pay on a like per project basis, so it's very, very affordable, well, it's pretty cheap. Um, the heavily wooded areas is going to be challenging though, depending on where you are uh, in the world. And the ground control points, again, they become really, really critical if you're trying to tie that data set into any other data set. So that absolute accuracy is really, really important. 
Um, even with my high-end equipment, which is, you know, $25,000 worth of equipment, if I don't have a known point, my horizontal accuracy for that, that uh, tying it into other data sets, the absolute accuracy, is usually within two meters or so. The vertical can be off by 100 feet or more. Um, you really need to have some additional process, some additional points in order to tie it in for that absolute accuracy. What software would you use to convert a topographic file into CAD for someone to be able to 3D print a model? Would it convert the GPS or GPX data from trails to a 3D form as well? That's a complicated one. Um, so topographic file, it depends on what you're starting with. If you're starting with a DEM or a point cloud or a 3D mesh, there are different approaches for each one, I'd say. Um, and then there are, if there are some sites online that if you just want a lower res that will pull basically that SRTM data and output an STL file, which is what 3D printers use. Uh, but that's using the publicly available data. So that's different than if you collected the data yourself. Converting GPS or GPX data from a trail to 3D, that's gonna take actual 3D modeling uh, because it's just going to be a, a 2D line. Um, so you'd have to integrate that in and then 3D model that. What software did I use to make the animated GIF? Uh, there's definitely online ones that do it. Uh, I use Photoshop a lot and I was already in Photoshop making those photo matches. So Photoshop, you're able to make a GIF. Um, and so I did all that in Photoshop. Can story maps be created and shared without a paid Esri account? Uh, created, I don't think so. Shared, yes. Uh, so to create the story maps, you can absolutely, or to create them, you do need a paid account, I believe, but to share them, you can absolutely share it. You can make it publicly accessible and then anyone can access it if you'd like. Uh, let's see, Jake Karsten, nice to see you, buddy. Uh, are you able to move the individual rocks in the 3D model to move them into place? Short answer, yes. Long answer, you need to do a little bit of work in the 3D model to separate them from the rest of the terrain. All right, gonna keep moving on. Uh, many of the examples here are of desert or otherwise largely untreated areas. Can you speak to the utility or challenges of trying to use these tool sets in heavily forested areas? So I think we covered that. The only one that is really going to be affected by tree cover um, heavily is is the drone technology, which one you decide to use for that. And again, it really depends on how dense it is. Um, all righty. Have I ever used land effects and would I recommend it for trail planning? Um, there, I think there might be a couple softwares out there called land effects. The one I'm familiar with is a plugin to AutoCAD. Uh, I've definitely used it, never for trail planning. I've used it since my background's in landscape architecture. I've used it for um planting plans irrigation design things like that um and i apologize if that's a different land effect than, than uh what you're asking about john you missed the question above that from robin um the trainings and resources one yes sorry that showed up below it for me for some reason um what okay, are the best sorry. trainings and resources for learning to process data collected by drone for somebody that is already an ArcGIS user. So I would say best trainings, I'm gonna actually expand on a little bit. For um, learning to get your FAA license, there's a really good resource called remotepilot101.com. Um, not associated with them all, it's just the one that I've always recommended. For collecting and processing the data, I'd say it, it really depends on what software you're going to use for those. Uh, so again, I'm, I'm a pix ambassador, so those are the softwares I use. They have a lot of really good videos and forms that they maintain themselves. Uh, other softwares, I would say, similarly have good videos and training stuff online. So uh, Metashape uh, is made by AggieSoft is another option. Um, you know, there, there's a handful of them out there, but I would say it depends on which software you wanna use. And then once you have the data for bringing it into ArcGIS, I mean, it's, 
if you're used to working with DEMs or contours or ortho, ortho aerials from other sources, it's really the same uh, once you get it into GIS. Do you have any recommendations for trainings for some of these apps? So like the GIS 3D apps, um, I sometimes find it hard to learn these tools when the trainings are unrelated to our work. Um, it's a good question. So I would say, I don't have a great answer for you off the bat, um, other than playing with them some, and then as you play with it, you start to understand some specific things you might want to be looking for, and then you can do some searches online. And John does customized training as well for folks in their organizations, sure. whether they're government agencies or nonprofits. Sure, but I, I did already give my one shameless plug today. So I gave that one for you. <laughs> All right, um, okay. I work for a large conservation nonprofit in Maine, managing our various properties. I'm a jack of all trades. I wanna use these software pieces to help bring us up to modern time, but there's so much and so many pieces of software to learn. How do you keep folks just getting into this type of work on track to make meaningful maps and data for our organizations without being overwhelmed? That's a great, great question. I would say start with a list of what, what things you want to accomplish, and then you can take it step by step. So if it's, you just want to have some digital maps to start with, uh, you know, take, um, take account of what, what data you have. You guys have no data at all. Okay, well, maybe it's starting with, uh, starting to learn a little bit of QGIS or ArcGIS. You can pull in Google Earth Maps, so maybe you can see some of the trails and start tracing those, those trails on that. You can use your phone and maybe start tracking some of the trails, or you can ask, uh, you know, volunteer or staff members to start tracking the trails with um, on X or Venza, any of those, and then you can start pulling them into GIS and you'll know, focus on those things for a little bit. Um, and then, okay, maybe next step you want to start making illustrative maps or you want to move it online, then take it step by step. Uh, so, you know, again, it really, it's, list out your priorities and try to tackle one project at a time. Otherwise, you're right, you can get completely overwhelmed. What are some examples of where QGIS may be better than RTIS? Um, I might, might upset people with this answer, but I love QGIS. Uh, I use it for almost all of my desktop processing for GIS. Um, I use Esri for one or two tools that just don't work well in ArcGIS, and I use, Arc, or sorry, don't work as well in QGIS. And obviously for everything online, it's all Esri. So Esri online, there really isn't anything online for QGIS. Uh, I'll also state as a caveat, most big corporations and municipalities, so a lot of time our clients do use Esri ArcGIS. And so a lot of times you do have to just keep in mind how you're coordinating between them. The data that's going into them is the same. But if you're wanting to share like the map layout, you want to be working in the same software that your client's working in. Uh, David Dietermeyer, nice to see you too. Um, with the newer technologies being used for master planning projects, what kind of feedback are you getting from the overall public that now are exposed to the new materials? Um, I think it's, it's still newer, but expectations are going up. You know, so it, it's still in a state where we show some of this stuff and people are blown away. Um, and really impressed, but we're also getting to a state where we show some of it and they're like, yep, yep, that's what we expected. Um, so I, I think it's becoming more and more adopted. Uh, the biggest thing that I love seeing is people understand what we're talking about a lot more. You know, things as simple as one of the, the photo markups we had was a, a really simple drone photo. There's what we would call a PUD, pointless up and down, or um, and so basically it was a longer reservoir in the existing trail was really a green trail, except this one section went really steep up a hill and then really steep down the hill. There's no reason for it. Uh, so instead, we have a, we rerouted it to make it contouring around. Explaining that just verbally or on a 2D plan view, a lot of people miss what we're talking about. You take five minutes to mark it up in InDesign or Illustrator, and people immediately understand what you're talking about. The other nice thing about <laughs> The other nice thing about being able to graphically show clients is, you know, folks are busy. We had COVID. 
you're working in an area with cryptogamic soils, you don't want 40 people out there reviewing the flag line. So literally they can review flag lines and get a really good idea without traipsing over 15 or 20 miles of trail conceptual alignments. And I feel that's not only good for the environment from a, from a less impact standpoint, but it's good in today's world when especially government workers are so over, overtaxed and understaffed that they don't have the time to go walk 15 miles of new proposed trails. They could walk two or three and then look on the drone videos and the photogrammetry and see, well, that's the same veg and the same slopes. And so I feel it really helps from those two standpoints. Yep. Yeah, thanks, Tony. Uh, can you speak to the functionality of using basic Google Maps? I think there's definitely, definitely things you can do in Google Maps, um, probably more than I've explored. Um, but it's also a really good data set. So even in ArcGIS or QGIS, you can pull in the Google aerial views, the Google street maps, uh, terrain maps, things like that. There's also, I believe it's called Google My Maps, where you can kind of start to map up uh, your own routes or own markups in just a, a web-based Google map, basically. I'll add so something. These tools yeah. yeah, I'll add something to Carolyn's question as well is, when we get projects that are, you know, a person calling in, they say, you know, hey, I've got like a half acre out in the backyard uh, and I'd like to build a trail. Pretty much those don't even go up to John's level. Those pretty much just stay at my simple level. I'll typically work up a conceptual map on Google Earth. I'll know the approximate distance. I'll base my bid on that. And then I'll go out there and essentially design the trail because they don't need the complexity of a trail master plan or a recreational trail plan. They just simply need one trail or two trails planned on a smaller acreage. And typically, you know, with the Google Maps, that's something that most every landowner can just download and then get on it and play with it from different aspects and look at it. So I find it useful on smaller projects where we want to use less tech uh, and be less illustrative in our plans. Yep. Yeah. Google Maps and Google Earth as well. Yep. Um, will these tools work for OHV or off-highway vehicle trail systems as well? Absolutely. Uh, I'd say not in all cases, but in most cases, uh, these most of these technologies will work even better just because OHV trails are inherently larger. So there's kind of less clutter to um, confuse our data with, if that makes sense. Uh, when you are setting up the forms and tracking maintenance issues and things like uh, field maps or collector or survey one, two, three, do the public users need to download those apps in order to enter the data? Um, yes and no. If I remember right, and I haven't used survey one, two, three in a year or two, but purely going off memory, I believe they can download the app or some of them you can just access in a web browser. So on your phone, it's a link or QR code and it would just open in. Safari or Chrome, whatever your web browser is, if I remember correctly. Uh, what brand handheld GPS do you recommend? How accurate is it able to get? I'll let Tony answer that. I mean, I'm honestly, I just use my phone for the GPS because they're pretty much as accurate. Uh, the main limiting factor on GPS is what's legally allowed. And in a lot of cases, the newer phones and the handheld GPSs are butting up against similar accuracies. What do you think, Tony? Yeah, I mean, the only thing is, is like on when we did Virginia Canyon Mountain Park, we used a Trimmel unit uh, that had submeter accuracy because they wanted that level of detail. Uh, so, you know, once you get into the $5,000 plus handheld units, you can start getting that higher accuracy. Yep. Yeah, and you can, of course, go down a huge rabbit hole of GPS and survey equipment um, with the... Uh, PPK and RTK and all sorts of fun stuff that we do get into with the drones, um, but it gets a lot more cumbersome, a lot more expensive, a lot bigger equipment to haul around. Uh, federal, federal trail sign standards require five pieces of information, max and average cross slope, average and max running slope, average minimum width, surface type and length. Are you able to collect trail data to that degree? Um, Quinn, I'm not sure if you meant specifically with uh, the drone data or just any of the tools we're using. So I'd say depending on the site, yes, but depending on the site, uh, it might require on the ground stuff in addition to data from the air. 
Um, and knowing how you're going to use that data and what you need out of it definitely changes how you collect it. So the flight pattern you use, how high up you are, how many photos, how much overlap, uh, and how you process it. So uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge proponent of think about how you want to use the data in the beginning. That's part of that office planning and use that to determine how you'll collect the data, both in terms of your process, but also what types of hardware you use. So I think with the tools we presented, you can absolutely collect all those things, but you'd use some different tools for that, for those same metrics, depending on what the site you're working on is like. How important is it to have an understanding of the mathematics behind photogrammetry? Um, not super important, but I'd say as far as the mathematics, but it is important to have an understanding of, at a basic level, what the program is trying to do. Um, you know, a lot of folks do use photogrammetry software and they ignore a lot of the settings and just use the defaults. That works great for simpler sites. Um, and so for most people, it'll work great for a while. If you really start doing more complex sites or you want to use the data in different ways, then you just need to start learning what those different settings are uh, and, and how they impact the data. Um, but you really don't need an understanding of like, what is the actual math? What is the actual algorithm behind the software? Uh, it appeared all the examples you gave showed the 3D data in 2D, like photo renderings, videos, have you had experience integrating the 3D data and design planning into AR or VR. Um, I'm not a huge fan of virtual reality. It's just, I, I can host 3D models and people can rotate and move the 3D model around on their screen. For me personally, I don't get a whole lot more out of the VR versus being able to move that on the screen. AR, augmented reality, I think there is more potential on, but the downside is in order for it to work with the AR headset, you either you need to downsize the resolution of the data set so much that it's not that not that useful to me anymore. Uh, some of the the stuff that we showed, uh, like the steep tech one, which was embedded in a story map where it automatically played through the kind of each point of our assessment, that was an actual 3D model. So you could stop that and you could rotate and zoom in. You can move that 3D model around however you like. Uh, can you touch on battery usage for drones? So the small drones, the ones that are in the one to two thousand dollar range, you're typically will advertise the flight time, battery time as like 25, 30 minutes. You typically want to be planning for about 20 minutes of battery. So the cost of multiple batteries can certainly add up. Uh, some of the bigger drones, like the the biggest one we use, is still a quadcopter, so it has the four propellers. Um, that one flight time they'll advertise as like 45 minutes. We're usually planning for about 30, 35 minutes. Uh, we can cover a lot of ground in that time. Um, and then fixed wing drones uh, can stay up in the air for, for much longer, cover a lot more, more ground. You know, they can stay up for 45, 50 minutes, um, cover a lot of ground, but you have a lot less control. So uh, you're not doing manual flight with those typically. Um, I think that was the last one I saw. Uh, Candace, do you guys have other ones? Um, I saw oh, yeah. one. Go ahead. Um, it was the one about the QGIS over ARC. Uh, oh, I answered that one. Oh, you did? Okay, good. Yeah. All right. Awesome. <laughs> that was the one I said some people will be pissed off at my answer. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, I think you covered, I mean, there were so many questions. So thank you so much for going through that. I think it worked out really well. And I think you answered a lot of questions. Um, and of course, if anyone has any follow-up questions, you are more than welcome to contact the um, the presenters and ask them. I'll share my follow-up email again within two days post-webinar once I gather all of the um, attachments and everything. And there's probably going to be some more resources as well that I'll include um, that Tony had mentioned. So I'll make sure to get with him to include all of those resources to update the slide and share with you guys. Um, 
so again, I want to thank our presenters and I also want to thank, whoops, I want to thank our um, webinar partners that include the Bureau of Land Management, the Federal Highway Administration, the U.S. Forest Service, as well as the National Park Service. And if you are enjoying our webinars, uh, please consider donating as little as $5 by texting I'm for Trails to 44321. Uh, your donation will go to the Trail Capacity Fund, which is a grant program of American Trails. And the next round of applications will be available um, in the fall of 2023, and more uh, details will be online soon for that. And as noted on the slide, I'll select a couple people who donated immediately following the webinar to receive uh, our Trail Boss mug as a thank you. Uh, lastly, we hope you'll be able to join us for these upcoming webinars uh, taking place over the next couple of weeks. A reminder that they are free along with free learning credits. So thank you again to everyone for attending. I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day and happy trails.